Secret Machines, book one, Chasing Shadows. Part two, Jennifer, Louvre, Swaziland, present day. Jennifer Quinn stared at the American woman in outraged disbelief. You can't do that, Jennifer said. You are not allowed. I've spoken to the school principal, and he feels that it would be confusing to the girls, said Mavis. She wore a prim smile that Jennifer wanted to slap off her face. Confusing, she echoed, gripping the table edge until her knuckles went white. What is confusing about condoms? She slammed a foil packet onto the table between them. Mavis averted her eyes but spoke in a maddeningly even tone. You are attempting to politicize this event, she said. AIDS is political, Jennifer shot back. Rape is political. Pressuring girls into marriage is political. It is not the place of peace and action to interfere with local custom and beliefs. Jennifer gave a hollow laugh. This isn't about local customs. This is about your own prudishness. She shot back. She was losing it. She knew, and it would only make things worse. But she could not hold back the anger that had been building over the six weeks she had spent in Swaziland. This is about sex, Mavis. I know you don't want it to be, but it is. And refusing to talk about it is not helping anything. Hell, even the government knows it. When you cross the border from South Africa, there are boxes of free condoms at the customs and immigration checkpoints. This event is supposed to be about female empowerment, Mavis returned. Still placid, still secure. Exactly, Jennifer shot back, and that's not something you you get with a few posters or girl power sing-alongs, and it sure as hell isn't something you get reciting poems about our Lord and Savior. Peace and action is not a religious organization, and you need to stop using social activism as an excuse to preach your damn beliefs. Mavis's composure buckled. You may think you are better than us, Miss Quinn, but I will not tolerate that kind of language in my office. That kind of language? exclaimed Jennifer. We're trying to build a culture where girls don't get beaten into prostitution or die of every known STD on the planet. And you're offended by my language? You know what, Mavis? Fuck you and your holier-than-thou attitude. I don't think I'm better than anyone, but I am paying for this event. And we will not only give out condoms, we will demonstrate their correct use. So I, just, so I suggest you go down to the market and buy a box of cucumbers. Hell, you can even eat one. She knew as soon as she said it that something wasn't right, and not just because she'd finally called the poisonous old bitch on her sanctimony, Mavis smiled. Not her usual serene and beatific, and beatific smile, mimicking the smile on the plaster saint that looked down on her desk, but a smile expressing something smaller and harder, a bitter satisfaction that was almost amusement. Well, there's the thing, she said, sitting back. Jennifer waited, but when Mavis said no more, prompted her, What's the thing? You said you are paying for this event, said Mavis, but that's not strictly true, is it? Your father in England is paying for the event. Same difference, she said, as it turns out, said Mavis, enjoying herself. Not so much. Why? What do you mean? Mavis's smile widened until she looked like one of the crocodiles sunning on the riverbank, not half a mile from where they now sat. She fished a notepad from her drawer and made a point of consulting it. Your father has terminated all fiscal support for this project, she said. I spoke to him personally, warning him that this might jeopardize your position here since it has been, as I am sure you are aware, somewhat vexed. And, Jennifer prompted again, Keen to get this over, apparently, said Mavis, and believe me when I say that I really can't imagine why he wants you to come home. Jennifer marched away from the thatched hut and stopped, breathless under a devil thorn in the gathering dusk, and released the tie around her chestnut ponytail so that it broke in a ragged wave around her shoulders. She was wearing khaki shorts that left her long, 
tanned legs bare from thigh to calf, her feet encased in sturdy boots. She thumbed open another button of her sky-blue safari shirt and wafted the fabric, sweat running down her chest. Overhead, a flight of royal ibises rehearsed their raucous calls, and somewhere she heard first the roar of an automobile engine and then the call of a hippo. Further down the road, she could see the children in their uniforms making their way home after school, chattering in Siswati, some of them laughing and jumping about with the kind of childish delight she rarely saw in England these days. Her rage faltered, and she was struck with a sudden sadness that felt like failure. She snatched her cell phone from her pocket, then remembered she would have no signal out here. She would have to drive to Mababane, Mababane, Mbabane, just to talk to her meddling father. The thought of the drive on narrow, uneven roads in twilight, pausing for cattle and warthogs in the road, and then his smooth, patronizing tones when she finally reached him made her anger spike anew. This is so like him, she cursed loudly, a stream of furious invective that made some of the kids down the road strain to hear what the funny white woman was shouting about. When she felt suitably chastened, she took a long breath, restored the ponytail to keep her hair out of her face, and climbed into the jeep. Part 3. Edward, Hampshire, England, present day. Edward Quinn placed the phone on the edge of his polished mahogany desk and considered it. She wouldn't call, not yet at least, possibly not at all. He rubbed his face, feeling the jolly flesh move the jowly flesh move. He had put on weight over the years. He didn't know when exactly. It had just happened, like a slow poisoning all those years, sitting in boardrooms, eating foie gras and drinking port. He avoided mirrors now, not so much disgusted by his own swelling bulk as disappointed with the loss of who he once was. That was why Jennifer wouldn't call back. She could pontificate about the evils of capitalism, but he sensed in her lately less moral outrage and more of something simpler, a disappointment in him for not being the father she had once believed in. It used to make him angry, but now, slowing with age and afflicted by all the persistent little ailments that came with it, he felt only loss and sadness. It was time to do something about it. She had no right to be indignant. He reminded himself, lighting a cigar. She had been raised wanting for nothing and had been sent to the best possible schools where she had flourished. He had given her everything, too much perhaps. It had all come so easily for her. And now, almost a decade clear of her Oxford graduation, she was still drifting from one Save the World project to another without focus or any larger sense of purpose. Certainly she was smart and strong and clever. She worked tirelessly. He couldn't deny her that, pouring every ounce of her heart and soul into whatever she was doing, as if nothing on the planet was more important. But then she would read about a new endangered species or a virulent disease, something that needed saving or preventing, and she would walk out and get on the next plane to South America or Africa. She could do so because he made sure she could, providing her with a constant stream of funds from the various businesses he owned. Money she so despised. He had never thought her a hypocrite, but he would be lying if he didn't say that there were times when he thought that she had also disappointed him. She had so much talent, so much energy and resourcefulness, scattered like crumbs before pigeons, but dwelling on it would avail him nothing. Quinn turned to his desktop computer and accessed his protected files with a series of complex passcodes protected. The hackers he had hired to break in had remarked. That was an understatement. He had employed a deep encryption system based on lattice reduction and other forms of asymmetrical algorithms linked in chains and separately coded by independent operators, none of whom knew what the rest were doing. It was, he was confident, more secure than the Bank of England. The British government and MI5 combined, which was just as well, because leaking the contents of his hard drive to the press would bring all three down at a stroke. He scanned his accounts, hundreds of millions of pounds, billions. His investments were solid, like continents, great sprawling rafts of money spreading from one side of the earth to the other, sustaining much of what lived on the surface. But from time to time, the entire mass would buckle in a great tectonic shift, erupting and reforming in ways that changed the world. Today would be one of those days. Continents moved at their own pace, according to their own rules. Money, 
for all its chaotic energy, could with a firm hand be made to do what you told it. Edward, Edward Quinn had such a hand and could, with a few key strokes, alter the face of the entire planet. This had been true for a long time. He had known what his money was capable of doing for 20 years or more without it unsettling him unduly. But then Anne, his wife, his one true love, his confidant and all he could safely share, had started losing weight and suffering from inexplicable fevers non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the doctors had told him he hadn't known what the words meant, a fact that shocked him almost as badly as the diagnosis itself. So he had learned everything there was to learn about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because that was how Edward Quinn met adversity, with knowledge and expertise, and of course with money. He'd learned to speak fluently about B-cells and to nod with understanding when his consultants used words like immunoblastic or lymphoplas mice lymphoplasmacytic and he'd written checks that would have paid off the national debt of small nations none of it helped after a struggle lasting two years the girl he had first met half a century ago collecting shells on brighton beach his sweet beautiful perfect annie was gone edward was left with a rambling mansion full of servants whose names he didn't know and a daughter who never called except to ask for money for some new cause there was more, of course, more stuff, more things, more money. None of it seemed to matter much. There was his work, of course, not the corporations on whose boards he sat, the companies who listened, who listed him on their mastheads, his real work. But lately, even that had started to trouble him. He lay awake most nights now thinking, remembering, regretting. Something had to change. The board wouldn't like it. And it was going to be the hardest battle he had ever fought, which was saying more than most people would ever know. But it had to be done. It was time. Jennifer would help, maybe not consciously or deliberately. He might not be able to tell her everything until the worst of it was over, but her presence at his side would make all the difference. That, too, would be a battle. But if Edward Quinn couldn't wrangle his own daughter, it really was time for him to. What did the Americans say? Hang it up? Something like that? She would understand, eventually. He was almost sure of that. After all, the work had to be good once. They had lost control of it, allowed it to turn into other things, but it had been good at the start. He still believed that. Sometimes it was only the only thing keeping him going. There had been that one day when she was small, when she had come into this very room and found him studying what he thought of simply as the project. There had been a chart on the wall that she should not have seen. She had stood in the doorway, a little girl of nine or ten, staring, her head cocked to one side, trying to make sense of what she was looking at before he whisked it away. He wondered if she remembered. Perhaps it was time to show her the rest. The intercom buzzed. Yes, he said. Your helicopter is approaching, sir, said Deacon. Quinn's private secretary, cum butler. Quinn checked his Roger Dubois watch, a spectacularly expensive piece he liked because he could see all the inner workings through its silicon casing and sighed. It was a 37-minute flight to the office in central London. I'll be right there, he said. He looked at the framed photograph of Annie and Jennifer on the corner of the desk, the two of them in shorts and t-shirts after some mother-daughter 10k, both holding their medals and beaming. He had only put it there last week after a lifetime keeping work and home as part as far apart as was possible. Too late, perhaps, certainly for Annie, though he felt in his bones that she would approve of what he was about to do. Quinn logged off and shut down his computer. He had just shut his briefcase when he heard the door snap close behind him. He hadn't heard it open. Quinn was surprised when he turned. The figure in the doorway was pointing a long-barreled pistol at him. You? He gasped. Hello, Edward. How did you get in? I'm good at getting into places people don't want me to. You ought to know what? You ought to know that. And you like to keep things between friends, said Quinn, though the gun doesn't look especially friendly. I wasn't planning to use it. Then why do you have it, said Quinn. If it becomes necessary, I'll use it. But I thought you jumping out the window would be more poetic." Quinn glanced to where the smoked bulletproof French windows opened on the balcony. It was only a four-story drop, but it would achieve the results his visitor seemed to want. And what makes you think I would do that, he asked. The visitor moved to the desk and eyes still on Quinn, turned the pistol onto the photograph of Jennifer and Anne. Quinn's composure evaporated. He was dead, he knew, but he would not give up his daughter. If you touch Jennifer, he began. You'll what? asked the visitor. Why would you hurt her? 
Quinn asked, hating the crack of desperation that snuck into his voice. This has nothing to do with her. Exactly, and I'd like to keep it that way. And if you sign this little note I have prepared for you, and then step off your very fine balcony, that's how things will stay. The visitor placed a single sheet of paper, a suicide note, written in flowing blue-black ink. Quinn glanced at it, admiring how it was meticulously forged. With what looked like his own Cartier fountain pen in his own hand, they were always so careful. What assurance do I have that if I do as you say, you won't kill her anyway? Why would I? As you say, this has nothing to do with her. She's merely a bargaining chip, something that gives me an edge in negotiating. You, of all people, should respect that. Quinn let go of the attache case attache case, and considered the window. In the same moment, the intercom came back to life. The helicopter is here, sir, said Deacon. The visitor raised the pistol to shoulder, shoulder height and was siding down the barrel into Quinn's face. Edward gave a fractional nod. I'll be right down, he said. He signed the letter. As he sat back again, he knocked over the little wooden lion Jennifer had given him for Christmas when she was ten. He considered it for a moment, then put it carefully down, pausing only to pick up the photograph of his wife and daughter, which he clutched to his heart with a surge of sadness. He stepped toward the window. He opened the French windows and stepped out into the English air, damp and cool, gazing down at the mansion's gravel forecourt below wreathed in a mist that was almost rain he did not look back toward the visitor with the pistol or down to where his broken body would soon be found by a shrieking maid but instead but instead gazed out into the gray air seeing nothing his hands gripped the photograph and as he stepped up onto the ornamental balustrade he whispered to them sorry i tried too late i'm afraid but I tried. Four, Timica, New York, present day. It was typical, of course. Traffic would be bumper to bumper on a morning when she had a Skype interview from the office. First thing, Timica eyed her fuel gauge uneasily. Don't give up on me now, she warned Dion's moldering Corolla. The car had taken to burning oil at twice the usual rate blowing out great clouds of blue, acrid smoke behind her. You've got to get that POS fixed, she told Dion the night before. It's going to die and leave me freezing by the curb. If it's such a piece of shit car, Dion shot back, why not take the subway like everybody else? Yeah, God forbid you should break out your wallet for anything you can't stick in your PlayStation. Tamika had shot back, staring her boyfriend down until he wilted and his eyes slid back to the TV. That's what I figured. They were supposed to be going to Atlantic City for the weekend. Her idea, she'd pick him up after work and they'd be on the road by six, assuming that the car survived the day. If it didn't or something else happened to screw up their trip, And if she got the message that Dion was relieved, things were going to go downhill in their Mount Kisco apartment faster than the crappy little car was ever likely to manage. The Corolla sputtered, stalling. She gave it a little more gas, watching in the rear view mirror as another cloud of black smog plumed out behind her. Jesus, lady, said the cab driver who was sitting alongside through his window. What are you burning in there, napalm? That's hilarious, she spat back. You should be on stage. He made a face, and Tamika urged the Corolla forward a few feet so she wouldn't have to look at him. On the west side of Union Square, she saw saw blue lights flashing in front of a cafe. The sidewalk had been partly cordoned off with yellow crime scene paint tape. A pair of uniformed police officers were standing around doing nothing as far as she could see. The traffic slowed to a crawl so that drivers could rubberneck, but there was nothing to see. She leaned across to the passenger side, brandishing the ID in her wallet. What's going on here? She called to the closest cop as she crawled by. He stooped to look into the car and rolled his eyes. Figured it would be you, Mars, he said at the precinct. They call you the question girl. I can't think why. 
asked. Well, thinking never was your strong suit, she replied. His name was Officer James Brown, and boy hadn't she given him a hard time for that in high school. His phone number was still on her contact list from when she'd organized their 10th reunion. Hey, Jimmy boy, you feel good? Like you knew you would? Still funny. Old guy got mugged, said Brown. Your crackpot website got a crime beat now. Just a concerned citizen, she said. He okay? You'll have to ask St. Peter, said the cop, another comedian, here at this time of day? Another beautiful day in the Big Apple? You want to move up? You're holding up traffic. Yeah, I'm the one holding up traffic, Tamika returned. You want to get these cars moving? Some of us have to get to work. The cop just rolled his eyes and shrugged. What am I supposed to do about it? Yeah, Tamika growled back. That's what I figured. She drove to the parking garage on East 16th Street and swung by an ATM to pick up the 500 bucks that was her share of the rent. Five minutes later, she was tearing up the stairs to her office, shedding her jacket as she ran up the stairs. The office was a couple of tiny rooms above a vegetarian restaurant next to the classical facade of the New York Film Academy on 17th Street. It was cheap and functional, an address that hinted at prosperity, seriousness, and class. It also meant that she was able to include on her website a shot of the Union Square subway entrance with the shallow dome and, and hat brim ring that made it look like a classic flying saucer. Tamika bypassed the coffee pot with an effort of will and settled in front of the computer monitor in the one corner of the office that looked like an office as opposed to the to one of those crazy lady apartments where no one throws anything away and the cops only go in. When the corpse smell alerts the neighbors, it was a pro it was the professional corner, the Skype corner. She checked her appearance on her webcam. She was wearing her brassiest wig for maximum eff effect. A mop of glossy ringlets flecked preposterously with gold. Her business card read Tamika Mars, freelance investigative investigative journalist and blogger. She was also the host of debunction.com, a podcast and website dedicated to exposing and uh, ridiculing urban myths, pseudoscience, conspiracy theories of all kinds, and what Tamika grouped together as mainstream superstition. She had pages on everything from the Loch Ness Monster and the JFK assassination to the miraculous statues of the Virgin Mary in Mexico. Though she wasn't getting rich off it, the site was one of the most visited of its kind, and the advertising revenue was steady. The Huffington Post interview she was about to do would surely boost her visibility. Her staff was a part-time tech support guy called Marvin, whose brilliance in the computers and whose brilliance with computers was matched only by the amount of weed he smoked, and Audrey Stanhope, who Tamika likened to both a bloodhound and a pit bull when it came to sniffing out and chasing down stories, the metaphor worked, Tamika thought, because she could also be a royal bitch when it came to negotiating with advertisers. God damn it, she muttered. The wig looked fabulously outrageous. But she had a coffee stain on her sweater. She was already two minutes late for the interview and didn't have time to rinse it out. She pulled the detachable fur collar off her scarlet coat and arranged it around her neck, trying to decide if it worked as some kind of quirky fashion statement. It looked like a pair of weasels were mating on her shoulders, but it covered the stain. Oh, what the hell. She logged into her Skype account and waited for the call to come through, scanning her email on a second computer for links to various news stories. One featuring blurry pictures of Bigfoot, another showing some suspiciously two-dimensional English fairies, and a brace of other idiotic stories too obviously fake to merit debunction. That was what she called it, a ludicrous, bombastic, and eye-catching word that had become her trademarked website title, something sure to come up in the imminent Huff Poe interview. The interview began well. The host, a perky but shrewd-looking blonde woman named Nicole, lofted softball questions and Tamika knocked them out of the park. How long have you been running the site? What was the first case you wrote about? Tell us about some of the more elaborate hoaxes you've uncovered. Why do you think people are so quick to believe in plausible things? Tamika was calm and confident. Two and a half years, the Essex crop circles, which turned out to be the work of two drunk teenaged boys using a tractor and some towable farm gear? Well, there was the time the bankrupt owner of a Virginia lighthouse wanted to draw tourists by inventing a series of ghostly apparitions. I'm telling you, Nicole, this 
thing read like the script for a Scooby-Doo episode, and he would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for us meddling kids. It was only the last question, why people wanted to believe in things that obviously aren't real, that gave her pause. Tamika trotted out some familiar ideas about why people who live boring lives are drawn to mystery and conspiracy. And then Nicole, hinting at a bitterness she hadn't shown thus far, asked how Tamika felt about spending her life destroying other people's harmless fantasies. Tamika paused for just a fraction of a second, adjusting to the unexpected jab, then answered, She said she felt fine about it. Thank you, Nicole. She added that some of the things people believed in weren't harmless at all, and some were quite possibly dangerous, and that even harmless delusions were manifestations of a larger culture that had reduced science and objectivity to a kind of, he said, she said, debate in which no one person's authority or credibility was valued above anyone else's. The opinion of an eminent physician or archaeologist or environmental scientist was worth no more than that of anyone with access to a Twitter account, and sometimes the opinions of accomplished scientists carried less weight than those of people who were famous models or athletes or actors on a sitcom. Nicole seemed satisfied with Tamika's answer. In hindsight, Tamika felt the woman was ex- was attempting to goad her into saying more. Because it made for better footage, not because she disagreed with her. Even so, she was rattled at the end. And when the interviewer wrapped things up with, And can I just say that I love your hair and that fur drape? So fun. Tamika wasn't sure if she was getting mocked, if she was being mocked. Guess we'll see when it goes live, she thought. Welcome to Life in the Spotlight. Well, If it brought in some more revenue, it was worth it. She didn't need the Huffington Post's endorsement to know she was doing good. Necessary work. She was glad they'd asked her, Why do you do this? It forced her to answer it for herself, something she hadn't really done before. She approached the day's work with a new buoyancy that even Audrey's whining about her sorry personal life and how the people at Fox News got paid more than she did could not dampen. What's that thing around your neck? Marvin had finally shown up and was peering at her, leaning with one hand on her desk like he wasn't sure of his balance. Tamika snatched the fur off and tossed it onto her jacket. Nothing, she said. I was covering stain. Right, said Marvin, nodding with greater seriousness than the remark justified. Got it. Tamika wrinkled her nose. You stoned, man, because I told you about coming to work. To work like that? No, no, said Marvin, dropping him, dropping into a bizarre half-crouch and putting his hands up in a half-assed surrender pose, as he always did when he felt threatened. Swear to God, it's just, you know, passive. Passive? Yeah. My roommate had the... My roommate had the bong going this morning, and I may have caught some of the collateral vibe, you know. Tamika gave him a dubious frown. You up to installing the new firewall, she asked. Totally, said Marvin. Well, within my powers. I'll have it done before you can say firewall. He paused, reflecting upon this. But you might want to not say it for like two hours. Deal, Tamika said. Oh, and there's a package for you, he added, producing something about the size of a shoebox wrapped in brown paper and tied with thin twine. The doorman just handed it to me, he said. An old guy came by before you got in. He placed the parcel on Tamika's desk. Her name was written in unsteady block capitals and magic marker. There was no return address or sign that it had been through the post. Not everyone was a fan of what the office produced. She usually received belligerent explanations in the mail, rather than actual hate mail, but she'd had her share of death threats from people angry because she'd picked apart or ridiculed the assumptions they considered true or even sacred. She held the package gingerly, weighing it, Too light for a bomb, she thought, but not for anthrax or ricin or, more likely, talcum powder, which would shut the office down until they could get an all clear from the health department. I'm going to open this outside, she said, fishing scissors and rubbing gloves from her desk drawer. You want me to come with? Marvin asked. Audrey, Tamika noted, was making no such offer and eyed the parcel warily. Nah, I'm good, she answered. If I'm not back in five minutes, call in the hazmat team. Marvin looked unsure. Is the number in your Rolodex thingy? He asked. I was kidding, Marvin, said Tamika, picking up the package and stalking out of the room with a pointed look at Audrey. Hey, said the reporter with a better version of Marvin's hands-up defensive gesture. I just work here. You don't pay me enough to get blown up. 
Yeah, muttered Tamika as she pushed through the door and into the stairwell, drawing her scarlet raincoat raincoat tight to her body. That's what I figured. She didn't really believe the package was dangerous, but she crossed to the square across the street and chose a bench away from two old people who were exercising their dogs. She opened the parcel carefully, donning the rubber gloves and slitting the paper, then turning the box upside down at arm's length. No telltale white powder trick trickled out when she lifted the lid she found only a notepad it was blue hardbound with a cloth cover stained with age and use inside the cover was an envelope thick with heavy stationery covered in spidery script dear miss mars the letter began i hope to be talking you through the contents of this book in person since there is much to be explained but in case i am not able to i wanted you to understand something the contents of this book are extremely important i am confident that it will change your life and your sense of many things it is also extremely dangerous there are people who would kill me to prevent you from reading it and may attempt to kill you for doing so for that i apologize i will trust your judgment as to whether you will take that risk though I am confident in my regard for your sense of ethical responsibility. Read, investigate all I have to say, check it, subject it to your most rigorous debunction. Then call me. My time is short, even if no one tries to make it shorter. Until then, I am sincerely yours, Jersey, Jersey Aaron Stern. His name was followed by a phone number. Tamika wasn't sure what to make of it. It screamed conspiracy theory nonsense, especially the paranoid hinting about lives in danger, which was one of the major hallmarks of the genre. But the writing itself gave her pause. It was, the, it was an old man's writing, unsteady but sophisticated, as was the phrasing. Most of what she received was a train wreck of small and capital letters, third grade spelling and text message punctuation. This felt different. She opened the book opened the notebook carefully, filling its age and startled to find that it contained more of the same long-handed script, though the penmanship looked younger, more confident than the letter she'd just read. There were pages and pages of it, occasionally broken by little sketches and diagrams. It was clearly a journal, all entries carefully dated. She flipped to the front and caught her breath. The first entry laid out in blue ink. The desiccated pages, stained and smeared with dirt or even old blood, was labeled... Krakow, Poland, 1939. No way. You okay there, Tamika? She looked up to find Marvin standing over her. You look kind of spooked. You need me to call those hazmat guys or something? She hesitated, staring at the first entry. You know what, Marvin? She said at last. I'm really not sure.